And then again, like I mentioned earlier, the brassicas are the exception to the rule, and they certainly are again in this case. Um, brassicas have perfect flowers and are um, anatomically capable of self-pollination, but brassicas have a self-incompatibility gene. And basically what happens is it can recognize its own pollen and reject it. And this is how there's come to be so much genetic diversity within the species is because um, of the diversity in the, in the way that it mixes up its genes there. Brassicas are a pretty tricky way to get started if you are new seed saver. So maybe some of you are asking yourselves this question, you know, I have these four squash varieties, they're all in the same species, how do I grow them and still save seed from them? And the answer is there are a number of things you can do from, for isolation techniques. Um, in this picture, this is a picture actually of Heritage Farm, and you can see these cages that we've actually built up around peppers. Um, and this is a, the, an easy example because what we're doing, peppers are self-pollinating varieties, but we've put the cage around them just to keep insects out. And that way they can pollinate themselves without interference. But in the background, you can see these much larger tents. And we'll grow things like watermelons or melons or other cucurbits in there. And the, the logical problem is, okay, well, they need to cross-pollinate, but you're keeping all the bees out. So we'll actually rent bees or buy flies and put them inside the isolation tents to do the pollination for us. Of course, this is way out of the scope of most home gardeners, and there are other things that you can do. Um, hand pollination will be a um, webinar that we do later in the year, I want to say June. Um, and you can, you can do things by timing. You, you can grow one crop one year, save the seed, um, and have seed for the next two years. The year after, grow and save from another variety. There are different things you can work out with timing, even in the same seed growing season. So you just have to be a little bit creative. Um, and of course, if you're new, the best way is just to grow one variety from each species. You have to know your plant's life cycle as well. So um, basically you have to know how, what it needs to get from seed to seed. And so on the picture here on the left, we have seed. It grows through its whole life cycle, past that edible stage of when you would want it in a delicious salad. It bolts in the summer heat, sets out flowers, sets out seed. Um, so this would be an example of an annual. Um, a lot of seeds and garden vegetables are actually biennials. If you think of a lot of the root crops you have, you're actually eating those as annuals, but if they need to complete their life cycle, they're going to need a whole nother um, growing season. So you have to know whether that variety is an annual, a biennial, or, or how long it's going to need to create it um, to finish its life cycle. Again, starting with lettuce and tomatoes, and eggplants and some of these varieties that are annuals is a really good way to get started. And that kind of leads me to knowing the difference between market maturity and seed maturity. Here's some lovely eggplants. They looked so great in the garden. You're really proud of them. But unfortunately, when you're saving seed from them, you have to let them turn into eggplants that look like this, which are not so good for eating, but have really beautiful, mature, ripe, and healthy seeds in them. So um, there are some seeds that you have the lucky pleasure of being able to um, eat the seed or eat the fruit and save the seed, like tomatoes, um, and some that you kind of have to sacrifice a, fruit, a few eating um, fruits in order to have mature seed. So knowing your plant's life cycle and when to save the seed and when that seed is mature is important. And I'm kind of just going over the general guidelines, things to know about your plants, um, but there are lots of resources, and I'll get to those at the end of the talk, where you can look up specifically for the plant that you want to save seed from how to do that. Um, and this is a, a part, well, maybe one of the trickiest parts of seed saving is worrying about population size. And again, for beginner seed savers, especially if you're working with plants that are that are fairly inbreeding, like beans and tomatoes and lettuce, you don't have to worry so much about population size. But basically what population size says is that if you save seed from a limited number of plants year after year after year, you're really selecting um, for, you're really narrowing the gene pool. So you get the same problems with inbreeding depression that would cause um, 
loss of vigor, um, they might have a lower yield or something like that. Generally, your plants just lose some of their strength if they become too inbred. Um, so that might be a problem if you don't maintain a larger population size. Um, a general rule of thumb is I'll say the more inbreeding something is, the smaller the population size can be, the more outbreeding it is. Um, like those brassicas that we talked about that have to cross-pollinate, the larger the population size should be. Um, and so this means, um, you know, saving seed from your, if you're growing a, a lovely tomato variety that you really like, not saving seed from just one plant, but taking a couple fruits from a number of different plants just to make sure that you're getting a mix of genes in there. But I again want to say to beginners, you know, really start with understanding the pollination and then population size kind of falls in later. Um, and so now I'll talk really briefly about pollinators. Uh, with pollinators, that's another thing where you have to be an observant gardener. You have to know your pollination pressure. Go out into your garden and if you can hear the bees humming in your squash flowers, um, you're going to, to know that you have quite a bit of pollination. If someone has a hive nearby you, if you live near a natural area or a prairie, you might have a lot of, um, of natural pollinators. Um, if you're like me and you live on top of this windy bluff and um, for some reason I don't have a pollinator um, around me for miles, um, you might actually have to do some hand pollination just to get your seed, your plants to um, pollinate. So knowing your pollination pressure also kind of indicates how much you have to worry about varieties cross-pollinating. If you don't have a lot of pollinators, um, your tomatoes might not um, be at risk at all, uh, have very little risk for cross-pollinating. And then finally, um, we'll touch a little bit on, on environment, um, the cultural practices associated with how you garden. Do you have healthy plants? Do you have healthy soil? Um, because in general, healthy plants plus healthy soil equals healthy seed. So being able to take care um, of your plants past their normal edible phase and into their, their following life um, to complete their life cycle can take a little bit more care. In this picture in the background is actually an example of um, all of our biennials. And so, for example, here in Zone 4, Northern Iowa, we have to dig up all of the biennials in the fall, store them in a root cellar over winter, and then replant them in early spring. Um, and so that's quite a bit longer life cycle that we have to worry about. Um, will they get moldy while they're in the root cellar? That sort of thing. So kind of taking in co into consideration um, how your plants, um, how healthy your plants are. Um, again, consider the pollen sources. What are your neighbors growing? Um, if you live in a rural area, what are the farms around you growing? And do you have to worry about um, <clears throat> things cross-pollinating, even if your garden's set up so it doesn't cross-pollinating, can it, can it be uh, cross-pollinated by somebody down the road? And finally, time and space. As I've mentioned with biennials, you might have to leave it in there a lot longer, maybe a whole season longer in order to get seed. Um, but even with something like lettuce, which will go to seed in, a, in one year, it has to be in the garden quite a bit longer. And if you've, if you've ever seen a lettuce plant bolted, they get about four feet tall with these big flowers that have um, that take up quite a bit of space that kind of almost have this Christmas tree shape to them. Um, and, you know, if you're used to pulling out your lettuce and making room for other things after it bolts, um, you're going to lose a little bit of space in your garden. So that is my whirlwind um, introduction to seed saving and kind of some of the things that you'll need to know in order to get started. Um, I would like to point out some some resources that you could use. Um, again, first, you can visit our website. Um, Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth is a book that's available on our website. Um, and that's kind of the Bible of seed saving. You can look up any plant type and find out exactly what you need to go from seed to seed. A really great free resource is the is going to www.seedalliance.org and they have a, a 